Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Today we are taking out, I don't even know what to describe the vehicle today, Alexis. We're definitely taking out not just the two-seat version. We're, it's we're got taking the out, sidecar. Got the sidecar or it's the, uh, or it's the A Fork in Time uh, SUV is what we're taking out today okay. we'll as we that. go back back in time and as i mentioned during the last episode uh, one of the things that's happened here on the show and we're happy to to have announced then but happened to formalize a little bit now is we've asked one of our uh our most frequent guest to become a regular contributor i think that's the fairest way to describe it and so i mentioned in the last episode that's chris capola chris welcome officially to to your uh to your formal position on a fork in time and we've decided to triple your pay from what you've been getting before wonderful wonderful uh I was actually trying to negotiate uh, health care as well, but, you know, that that's for the next contract. Yeah, um, well, well, you got to leave something for the future. So, Chris, we are excited to have you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank uh, both you, Alexis, and all the other contributors out there for kind of building this thing up to allow me to coattail on it. <laughs> and, and and don't think of yourself as a coattail because you're going to be driving a lot of things moving forward. I know one of the things we were talking about off podcast here was the idea you were excited about being able to do episodes and shows that aren't your ideas, that are somebody else's ideas. Because what we've done primarily when you've been involved have been something you suggested or was a topic that was in that realm. So this is your chance to weigh in on something that you didn't know you were going to weigh in on potentially. Yeah. And, and I get to kind of enjoy what you and I have discussed with some of those topics is expanding your wheelhouse somebody giving you something that isn't quite a comfort zone so it gives you the opportunity to to think about some other things yeah i, I agree and and it, we, we haven't you know formalized exactly how this is going to work but i think i think it's a reasonable thing to assume that you'll probably expect to hear chris at least probably at least once a month give or take i know we've talked about some of the other things that are there uh, we may have him venture off one day and do a solo episode on his own so he can have the joy of trying to fill up 40 minutes worth of time and realizing it's just you talking for 40 minutes worth of time because Alexis and I have both done that and listened back to those episodes and they are cringeworthy sometimes when we do so. Yeah, that's uh, how you get a seven minute episode. That's how you get the seven minute. I forget what that episode was that on the Titanic. Was that? Yes. What? Yep. Yeah. It was the Titanic. Yeah, which holds the record for shortest episode. But um uh, again, I'm, I'm real excited about it. I've said that multiple times because I am. And and uh, Chris, as I mentioned in the in my introduction last week in the episode, the thing I'm excited about was exactly what you talked about, is that when we launched this thing, we had no idea what it was going to be, how it was going to work. And now we found people that we like talking to and that like what we like and, you know, are, are developing relationships in the community. And that part is sort of cool to me is that you know, a year and a half ago, we didn't know each, we could have bumped into each other at an airport and never known each other. Mm -hmm. Now you've been, I think, on seven episodes and we've had a chance to talk a little bit off podcast as well. And uh, to me, that's just a cool thing that, that that's to be able to share something with somebody you didn't know. And because of sharing something you didn't know, you get to know them. That's a cool thing to me. And so we're excited about that. So uh, enough of these introductions and welcomes. You're now part of the family. So now we're going to treat you treat you like your home. You're, you're not a guest anymore. We can we can trash you and do all kinds of other stuff. But what we're going to do now is take a quick break. And when we come back from the break, after we hear from somebody that helps make the podcast possible, we're going to launch off into the topic today because, Chris, you brought this topic up. And so I thought it was the perfect way for us to get you introduced. And it definitely relates to Alexis. So uh, that's a little bit of the tease before we go off to the break here is that uh, we, when we come back, it's going to be something that, that Chris wanted to do and that Alexis had a passion to do when we originally did it. So uh, we're going to see where that leads us when we get back. So hope you join us when we come back in a few minutes. Thanks. Hi there, guys. This is Alexis and Don taking a little break from the podcast to tell you about one of our favorite things. And that is what, Dad? That's Audible. And uh, what does Audible do? Audible does everything. At least it does everything when it comes to playing audio programming for you. So that's uh, 
I typically think of it as being audio books, but it's not just books. It can be periodicals, magazines, uh, theatrical productions, podcasts even now. Uh, just anything that you can imagine that is audio can come through Audible. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we, of course, love we are avid readers, both Dawn and myself. So, But we like to be lazy sometimes with our reading. We like to be read, too. So that's where Audible comes in. And if you're like us and you like reading, but maybe want to try being read, too, for a change, we have a little deal for you to check out Audible. What's that deal? The deal is uh, an opportunity for you to get a one-month free subscription to Audible, which comes with one credit. A credit is how you purchase, again, an audio book, uh, an audio program, whatever the case might be. And so if you follow the uh, either the, the link that's in our show notes or go to www.audibletrial.com slash a fork in time, you'll be connected there. You can see how to sign up. And again, you'll get that one month at no charge, a chance to try it, see if you like it. And uh, you'll also get one credit. Uh, which will go towards, again, an audio purchase. That could be a book, fiction, nonfiction, whatever it might be. And I guess the other thing to mention, Lex, is what happens if you also happen to be an Amazon Prime member? That means you actually get two credits. And as we get into the holiday season, I'm sure a lot of people are taking advantage of Amazon Prime. So take advantage of this, too. If you're an Amazon Prime member, you actually get two credits with this deal instead of one. So maybe two books. Yeah, two books. Or or that way you can check out different variety. You may, you may choose a fiction and nonfiction genre, for example, to see how you like that. One of the things I know that Alexis and I often talk about is sometimes a great reader can actually make a good book even better. Even better. And uh, a lot of the productions now, the audio books and other audio programs are done by excellent readers. And I know for me, I can think of some of my favorites, don't want to belabor them here, but uh, sometimes they can bring a whole new life into something you may have even already read before by hearing it spoken. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So we encourage you to take advantage of that offer. Again, that's a, a link in the show notes uh, on, our, on our website or go to www, www.audibletrial.com. Dot com slash a fork in time. Thanks. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Alexis, Chris, and Don along for the ride today as we go down this path of alternate history. And I went back and looked uh, to see which episode this was, Chris, and when this episode was. The episode in question is episode 64, which we entitled The Many Shades of Edward. And uh, for those of our regular listeners who hopefully have listened to that episode, we looked at a scenario. I think our particular particular departure point, Alexis, was what if Edward VIII had never sort of met or was aware of Wallace Simpson? And so he doesn't mm-hmm. abdicate for love because he doesn't meet his quote unquote true love. And that was our point of departure. And I guess it probably was shortly after that that Chris joined us for an episode. And Chris mentioned to me in an email or something like this, I have some different thoughts on an entirely different way to take that. (laughs) And so uh, we thought it would be Which is fine. That's what we do here. That's what we do here. That's the whole, it's forks, right? There's multiple forks. Is uh, So I thought that would be a really good place for us to jump off on here for the first episode where Chris is in his regular contributor role. So Alexis, I'm going to let you set up the what did. And then we're going to let Chris jump in and sort of uh, lead us down that different path for the what if. So what did happen in history? And, and I noticed right, when I so. listened to that episode today, I constantly used 1836 to describe the events of 1936. Yeah, you did. And so I'm actually very conscious, self-conscious mm-hmm. of that right now to not do that at any point during this episode to make amends. <laughs> well... We can try, because even I started doing it on that episode, I think. Uh, But we are in 1936 uh, for our What Did. Uh, And we are in, actually, we're going to start in January of 1936. So in January of 1936, we have the death of the king. That is King George V. Uh, He dies, I believe it's January 25th. Don't quote me on that, but I do know it was January. Um, And immediately when he dies, uh, his son, Edward VIII, becomes the king. That's what happens in a monarchy. There is no break. As soon as the the previous king dies, the the current monarch becomes monarch. So that happens in January. But he is not um, excited about his new role uh, of monarch, of king. So through the year, uh, several things happen. 
uh, ultimately leading to in December of that year, I believe it's December 11th, uh, he actually signs the instrument of abdication. Chris is nodding and smiling. I, I'm, so I'm, I'm nodding because, history. by the way, one of the other fun things that we're trying to pull in, um, what date was that that he resigned? That would be December 11th. Um, or December you guys 10th. are probably listening to this on December 11th. Correct. It literally is coming out the day he resigns. And now you can see why we asked Chris to join the show. He gets exactly. it. Exactly. See, I didn't, didn't even think about that, Chris. So, hey. Uh, when I sent that email and said, I have some very different thoughts, I marked in my mind December. There you go. That's when we're going. So yeah, in December, uh, Edward VIII, he signs his instrument of abdication, and he lists as one of his main reasons for abdicating is he is not allowed to marry uh, the woman he loves, which is Wallace Simpson, uh, and still uh, maintain the role of king. We, we talked in that episode, episode 64, um, there were several things with the government and parliament in terms of you can marry her, but she won't be queen. You can, you know, if you have heirs, they won't have a claim to the throne. Ultimately, Edward decided that um, that was not going to work for him. And he wanted to have a complete marriage. And the only way he could do that was to abdicate. So when he abdicates, his brother, George VI, who is the actual father of the current monarch, Elizabeth II, uh, he becomes king in December. So 1936 is actually known as the year of three kings uh, in British history, because we have George V right at the beginning, he does die in January. Then we have Edward VIII for the majority of the year from January to the middle of December. And then the end of December, we have George VI. So that's in a nutshell what happens in 1936. But Really, the reason why Edward VIII did not want to be king is because he wasn't allowed to be married to the person he loved, which was Wallace Simpson. So that's what we explored in that episode 64 was he never married, Mo he never met Wallace Simpson. So there was no reason for him to abdicate to marry her. And we also talked briefly about the fact that he was an older, would have been an old, was an older bachelor king. And so one of the questions that we asked was, would he have remained a bachelor king and what would have been the implications of that? So one of the forks was we still up getting to Elizabeth, who ends up being in line to the throne after her father passes uh, by being uh, by being his eldest, being the eldest niece of, 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 the, of Edward as monarch. By the way, it goes by David. So if at some point we talk about it when he becomes the Duke, the family. He's got like eight names, but yes, he does go by David in the family. And, and the other thing we talked about was, you know, a lot of the recent history, and we spent a lot of time in that episode talking about the crown. We do not get a paid compensation from the crown, I promise, but uh, but depict some of the events there around Elizabeth's early reign, and particularly the issues that became more and more to light about Edward's Nazi sympathies. I'll just leave them at that, how, how distinct they were. And so we spent a lot of time in our episode, back in episode... Uh, um, what is it, 64, uh, talking about, you know, this idea of a traitor king and what that would have meant. But Chris has already promised us we're going some entirely different direction here. So the suspense is killing me, Chris. What direction are we going in? So we're going to the Simpsons. <laughs> um, Wait a and, second. And, and, and how, how far just, away is from the line of the uh, – homework is not in line for the throne. Wait. I guarantee you that. Just you wait. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's one, um, scene where Ned Flanders is talking about their religion being founded on the principle of their right to come to church with wet hair, which they promptly abolished. What was the issue that led to the founding of the church of England? The right of the monarch to decide his wife, which right. they promptly abolished. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and if you look at the documents around why the reason why the argument used by kind of call it traditional British society against Wallace Simpson was that as king, he is the leader of the Church of England. Correct. That's their right, argument, yeah. that, that the religious aspect. Um, and just to kind of put kind of a fine point on it. Who is next in line for the British monarchy as we are speaking right now? A divorced uh, man? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so 
I, I, I feel like there is, you know, my fork is, is it, it, it's around the abdication, but it's that he refuses to abdicate and says, I am still going to marry her. Uh, Stanley Baldwin, who's the prime minister at this point, resigns in a fit of disgust. Sure, let's say that. And uh, Neville Chamberlain becomes prime minister again. Um, and kind of a throwback to my first episode. Um, I And you were not on it, Alexis, but I was talking about maybe the 19th century being considered the Bismarck era as opposed to uh -huh. the Victorian era. Um, because, and, and this is one of the things that I, I think I kind of bring to history is that perspective that uh, I'm a little more blood and iron. Um, I, I feel like the British monarchy is almost, in some way, it feels a little Disney World-ish. It's a tourist trap. But the one thing that this tourist trap has is the right to ask a prime minister to form a government. Yep. Um, we are right now in, in, in a situation where we might have a divided Senate. We don't have Mickey Mouse break that divide. Um, <laughs> we don't have a tourist trap do that, no. Uh, in Great Britain, the one thing the monarch can do to influence, to affect more policy making, more harder re you know, decisions is they have the right to choose who to ask to form a government. And the reason that's important is under normal circumstances, it's not important because you will have one party win 300, 400 seats in the parliament. And that leader is basically who's going to be the next prime minister. It only comes into play if A, nobody wins an outright majority. You have to have a unity government, which they just recently did right up until the last general election. Or if a government falls, who do you select to build the next government? And the most famous time this has happened is May 1940. Um, when you're talking about 1936, there's a lot of other stuff going on other than the British monarchy. There's the right. Spanish Civil War. There's the Rhineland. There's Ethiopia. And we haven't talked about China. There's another episode I want to do about them. Uh, a lot of this stuff is going on right leading up to it. And whoever takes over after Baldwin or if Edward is still in power, they're in power for some very busy days. But Baldwin resigns. Chamberlain comes in. Let's assume everything else plays out the way that it did in our timeline. So you come to May 8th. I believe it's May 8th, the evening of May 8th, 1940. Um, the British army is in France. Um, the Germans have invaded the low countries of Belgium and the Netherlands. And the Basically, the British government falls right before the entire German deluge hits. Um, kind of a bad time to be changing horses in midstream, but the British did it. Um, and there were two people called to Chamberlain's residence um, to decide who he would recommend to the king as the next prime minister. We hopefully all know that the person asked to be prime minister was Winston Churchill. If you have an Edward VIII on the throne, very likely the person asked to form the government is Lord Halifax. Mm -hmm. Who's... I, I think Edward was pro-German. I'm not even arguing that um if i'm going to be perfectly honest when i was watching the crown they have certain you know, whenever you're watching a show they have ways of showing you that this person is bad that this is the villain lighting yep. music sound 
And when I was watching in another way, you um, tell somebody is bad is call them a Nazi or compare them to Hitler. The whole time I'm watching the early episodes of The Crown, I'm sitting there shouting at the screen, he's a Nazi. This is coming. He's the bad guy. Stop this slow. <laughs> he's the bad guy. Um, I don't believe Edward was. Or, uh, sorry, I don't believe I got confused because guess what? Halifax's first name is also Edward. Maybe we should refer to the other one as David. I mean, there's only so many British first names we can choose from. <laughs> exactly. There really is. <laughs> um, That's why we got to an Edward VIII. Yes. Yes. Um, so, yeah. And because, um, it's, we're not, and because we're not, they're not allowed to have another John. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the other reason. I don't think there'll be another Edward after that, actually, either. <laughs> is, is it, do we think they need to start retiring names, like put the jersey up in Buckingham Palace? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the mental image you just created for me there, Chris, of uh, combining yeah. the, uh, what, you just, what you just described as the amusement park uh, element of the uh, of the uh, of the british english united kingdom monarchy and and a sports metaphor there I, i'm gonna have to work through that in my head um that's another episode so we can have like three or four based around the same thing yeah yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> which monarchs deserve their jersey to be retired right right so um halifax becomes prime minister um he basically can't control events for the next three weeks because like stuff has already been put in place. Things are going to happen the way they did so that we are in June, July, 1940. The British army escapes and they really do escape the continent. They make it out. That's about all you can say about it. Um, and then Hitler is sitting there looking at the continent, shaking his fist at Britain, kind of the same Napoleon thing. And Britain can't hurt Hitler. Hitler can't invade them. And uh, there's some feelers put out, even in our timeline, a man by the name of Rudolf Hess, who's technically the deputy Fuhrer. If there's one thing about the Nazis is they like titles. They like uniforms. So, like, everybody was something of – he uh, stole a plane, flew to Britain, and was attempting to negotiate a peace where – Basically, um, Great Britain will recognize German hegemony over the continent, and Germany will allow the Commonwealth and Britain to keep all of its possessions. And I think a Halifax government, while, while not pro-German the way in Edward was, would have been pacifist enough to accept that deal. Is, is it your argument there, Chris, that a lot of what in our in our in our timeline, the real timeline, so much of what drives events there is Churchill's personality and the the fight, 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 never surrender? Is that part of the contrast in some ways to Halifax? Uh, yes, I think that personality is a big part of what gets Britain to some extent over that one year hump. Um, there is a one-year hump there of, you know, they can't really, what, what, what are we fighting for? What is this whole thing about? Like, we are, okay, we're at a war, but um, what's going on with it? And why is it happening? And, and I think that determination of a Churchill was what helped keep it going. What helped keep the British focused on victory and keep them in the war through basically 1941. Because come July, we know that the Soviet Union gets involved. And after that happens, the United States gets involved. And then there's a very good argument. Hey, OK, we can do it. Um, it took a while to get to that point. Right. So that's the first thing. The other fun thing is this. Um, for those of you constitutional scholars of Great Britain, 
Um, the government that we're talking about here, call it the Chamberlain, Halifax, Baldwin government, when was it elected? 1935. It was actually one of the longest, it was the longest serving British governments because what happened in 1940 is they passed a specific law saying we will not have a general election until this war is over. Right. Um, they were due for, for an election in 1940. Um, and they postponed that because of the war. If we have a Halifax government um, negotiating a peace, you have to hold a general election pretty quickly. <laughs> um, you're due for one, and there's no reason to justify holding on. I mean... Literally, this government was elected to respond to the Great Depression, and oh yeah, here's all this other stuff that, that has happened. You might want to go back to the people and try and get some justification, some backup, some mandate for what you're doing. And Halifax would have to do that. And so under that scenario, we've got down to 1940 mm -hmm. with a at least a, a ceasefire armistice, maybe even a negotiated peace mm -hmm. in your timeline that's that's holding between Germany and uh, the United Kingdom. And now they have to call elections because they're due for elections and they're not at war. Yes. yes. So. Who do we see leading the various parties in that election? Um, whew, the fun thing is looking at British electoral politics between basically 1924 and 1945. It reminds me a little bit of the art of the um, episode I did on Teddy Roosevelt, because you have the parties in flux at this point. Um, the liberals... I mean, traditionally in Great Britain, going back to, I will concede this, I will refer to it as a Victorian age, only for the purposes of this example, um, you had the liberals and the Tories, the conservatives, and 100 years that had lasted, and after World War I, you had universal suffrage, and you had labor become the other party. The liberals haven't gone away at this point. The liberals are still around. Labor is rising. It's still the second most popular party, but there's still a lot of flux. And then let's throw in the Great Depression. Um, because in August of 1931, you had a general election where both the liberals and labor splintered over whether to support um, cuts to services of unemployment and housing assistance to combat the Great Depression. So you, the parties are, I mean, if you look at the election results of 1935, the, the parliament that is going into World War II and is the longest serving parliament in British history, you have five different parties represented. You have the national labor, then the regular labor, the national liberals and the regular liberals. So, depending upon the negotiations, you know, this isn't an immediate piece. I think it is going into the spring of 41. And what happens, and I already talked about it in June of 41. Uh, yeah, here we here, 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 you know here, 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 here we come with Barbarossa. Everything another, just keeps coming back. Yeah, another episode. Another <laughs> earlier episode. Um. <laughs> It's Chris's greatest hits. Yes, I know. <laughs> um, and I have not sold all of my albums. Oh, you're right. So, as, as somebody yeah. else did here in recent yes. days, a couple of somebody's did here. Yes. Bob Dylan and yeah. uh, and Stevie Nicks have sold. I'm the not to music saying we're that. Days. I'm not saying we're there yet, but we'll see where this goes. Um, yeah. So once you have that happen, labor changes 
in in all of your socialist Europeans and world opinions, literally overnight, Germany went from, well, initially Germany went from the devil incarnate to, okay, maybe we can work with them. And then back to the devil incarnate as soon as they invaded the Soviet Union. Um, labor in Britain in the 30s and all of these splits, the I'm going to call it traditional labor is against rearmament, hard against rearmament. Because they think if you build these, not to quote Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. If you build these w machines of war, the Germans will come. So they're somewhat against rearmament until the Soviet Union threatened. Not that labor was as lockstep as many of the continental communist parties, but there was a sense of some affinity for them. And when you see labor's when you see Barbarossa, labor definitely becomes more pro-war. So given that we're in a period of flux and given that it's the late spring of 1941, a very familiar name is going to come out as the war party leader. I think you would have Winston Churchill win a premiership in his own right on a policy of confronting Hitler. Um, and in my mind, I always liken this to the Peace of Amiens of 1803. That was intentional. That was not 1903. That was intentionally 1803, where basically Britain pauses the Napoleonic Wars because they had a change in government from Pitt the Younger to Henry Addington. And it's interesting to read about Addington because basically people look at him and he was an appeaser before appeasers were cool. <laughs> <laughs> if you read about Addington, they talk about how he gave Napoleon this breathing space and he was so, you know, letting Napoleon do what he wanted. I mean, it. if you were to do a find and replace Addington with Chamberlain, you could it would produce some interesting scholarly works um so in that time frame britain had a change of prime ministers similar to what we're saying leads to a change in foreign policy but changes right back and we still have another five coalitions to go before they actually take down napoleon and i think that's somewhat what you see where we sit here and we're talking about not the Second World War, but the Hitlerian Wars, the way we talk about the Napoleonic Wars. Right. Because you have the first coalition of Britain and France and Poland, the second coalition of Britain and the Soviet Union, maybe include Greece, because British are, you know, knowing Churchill, he loved to be somewhat impish and just kind of tweak the tale of a European power. I, if anyone would draw this connection between Amiens and, and this Halifax piece, it would be him. He, he loved references like that. So you would have a, you know, very similar situation of Britain looking at the continent and maybe we have a Balkan ulcer instead of a Spanish ulcer. But um, you would have a respite but it wouldn't be the end. You would have, I think, Churchill come back, win in his own right, and you would have a second anti-Hitler coalition of Great Britain and Greece. Just like in the Napoleonic Wars, Britain keeps funding, supplying somebody, and as soon as they're defeated, they go to support the next person. So the next one would be Great Britain and the Soviet Union. And then the fourth coalition is Great Britain and Soviet Union and the United States. Um, so I think it's interesting, but we keep talking about this. It might come back to our history. Very, very similar. Yeah, just just with a, maybe a longer period of time. And then you know, the thing that kept running through my head there, Chris, was, um, you know, whether it's true or not, or whether some of it is sort of revisionist looking back, because we know how it turns out, but certainly the affinity between Churchill and Roosevelt you know, their, their, the special relationship between the United States and Great Britain 
in many ways was uh, in, in, in the post-World War II period was the result of the special relationship that existed between these two very interesting leaders in the form of Churchill and Roosevelt. Um, but, you know, w w would Lynn least for example, come along in the same way if you have a different timing on the war? Uh, we've, we've talked about this in other episodes as where, you know, the, the really bizarre thing of, you know, the United States is certainly engaged in the war through material support, but not engaged through actual combat until they're pulled in by the Pearl Harbor attack, uh, see yesterday, <laughs> from when we're recording now as terms of, you know, that being another historical event. And then that, you know, strange thing of Germany actually choosing to declare war on the United States when it's arguably the case that they didn't need to. So under this sort of different sort of lead up with, a you know, the period of time that's different there and Baldwin and, you know, some of the others, Halifax, do, do you see that the United States gets involved probably at about the same time, or is it much later, like you said, the third, second, fourth coalition of the way that this plays before the U.S. joins the war on the European continent? Um, I would say it's probably later. I think one of the things to keep in mind is however long this Halifax interlude is, um, the deal is it provides britain the empire to britain what does the empire mean egypt india singapore who's sitting there licking their lips <laughs> the japanese and i think to some extent the weakness the distraction of the european powers not just um great britain but you know as 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 weird as this is going to sound to kind of European history focused people, the Netherlands is super important to this story because they control all of Indonesia. Right. All of that rubber, all of that oil, all, a lot of that critical material that um, Japan's out after. And I think one of the things that a Halifax interlude is going to change is that Britain is going to be able to focus on countering or on supplying its colonies, on bolstering its um, Far Eastern holdings. And I think that might push the Japanese domino further down um, so they are less Basically, the European powers look less prostrate. Right. There's some peace in Europe and probably, you know, the government in exile might well take over Indonesia. And it becomes a primary focus of theirs rather than just somewhere halfway around the world. Oh, let's just pick that off like a ripe fruit that's designed to fall into Japanese hands. Yeah, we, we actually talked about this, I think, the last time. I don't know if it was actually on podcast or off. We were talking about uh, a podcast that we both enjoy, uh, Dan Carlin's um, Hardcore History. And uh, he, he recently, we still in the midst of his uh, his epic. And you think our podcast episodes can get long. Man, we got nothing on Carlin. But um, he, he's the, the, uh, the his, his focus there talking about uh, the rise up to World War II. Um, uh, uh, the situation that occurs with Japan. I've lost actually the name of the podcast now in my head, or the or the, or the series that he's Super doing there. Nova Su in Supernova the in the East. Yeah, and if you can believe it, he did about three hours on yesterday. Yeah, on just what happened yesterday. Exactly, and and one of the things I remember in that was, and, and this alludes to what you're talking about, which is what the prelude. Why the Japanese thought that they had a chance to. Uh, to do some of the things that they did was the fact that there was this distracted nature of these, of the uh, of the colonies and the possessions there in Asia by the various European powers, that were and certainly once the war had begun in Europe, uh, you know, for example, hearing him talk about the defense of, um, you know, of Australia, and you know what eventually happens on Papua New Guinea and places. You know, you've got very little, you know, it's some Australia, it's, it's some Australians and some New Zealanders, that, and that's really about it, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, the British Army proper is engaged in Europe, and has to be there, and so it really changes, you know, the dynamics of that, and then, you know, again, I, what I was asking was trying to figure out how to get, the, you, 
what is the United States role? We've talked about this a number of times before. The default position of the United States was as much as possible to be in isolation, to not want to get involved mm -hmm. uh, unless you were pulled into it. And of course, they were eventually pulled into it with the, with the Pearl Harbor attack. But um, and then Germany declaring war. So you were definitely pulled into the European war. But uh, I could easily imagine a scenario where the United States, yes, does something like lend lease or provides materiel support. But, you know, do, mm -hmm. there's, there are no United States forces landing on Normandy in 1944, A, because that, that's much further down the path, and B, because the United States is not even engaged maybe by 1944. Right. And, and, and I think I actually look at the United States role in this. I, now that we are saying there may not be a link between the Pacific aggression and the European aggression, Maybe calling this the Hitlerian Wars is not appropriate, but the mid 20th century fracas, I, I think maybe we can call it that. But <laughs> I, I think the American role in the mid 20th century fracas could be similar to the British role in the 19th, early 19th century fracas of uh, we're the paymasters, we're the industrial might we control the sea lanes not that britain didn't but the united states can definitely help britain control the sea lanes and the control of the sea lanes is critical to allow american supplies to reach um the soviet union right to reach anyone who's actually doing the fighting if you look at a lot of the napoleonic wars napoleon is rampaging through germany through central europe into spain and the British army isn't really that engaged. They're here, they're there. But the role of the British was financing Prussian, Austrian, Russian, eventually Portuguese and Spanish opposition to the French. And I think that, you know, that is a very good role for the United States. That's to some extent, you know, one of the things we talked about when we did get involved was Len Lease expanded, and that was a big part of what allowed the Soviet Union to win and right. China to hold on. So, you know, it's the thing and, we and, 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 and latter 20th century um, U.S. geopolitics is, is a lot of that supporting someone to fight, the, you know, to fight by proxy. In that case, it's the Cold War against you know, Soviet or communist forces, but it's still the same thing. <laughs> we're going right. to, uh, we're going, we're going, we're going to back, you know, back whichever, whichever regime or whichever half of the country, if it's been divided in half, uh, represents, you know, what was considered to be the American ideal there, that that was a common thing that happened in the latter half of the 20th century. Right, right, exactly. So, so the burning question I have, Chris, is, does Edward get, does he, does, so you, you suggest he actually marries Wallace? Yes. Okay, so do you think he ends up then, given her age, the, it's unlikely she's going to uh, provide offspring to him. Mm -hmm. So do you think we do end up back with Elizabeth II? We just end up with Elizabeth in a very different timeline here, post this, yes. post, post, post mid-century fracas? Absolutely. Yeah, I do. I do. And not to... Um, denigrate one of Britain's major industries at this point, which is royal watching. Okay, yeah, it's a different name on the cover. Uh, okay, it's a different picture. <laughs> right. And, and and of course, you know, as, as Alexis alluded to, when I, was, when I was going back and listening to the episode we were talking about, which this is sort of the companion piece to, it's a very young Elizabeth who assumes yeah. the throne because of the circumstances, assuming that Edward lives to the age that he did live to, to which is the early seventies. You know, it's it's a much older Elizabeth that you know that takes the throne with, uh, I guess, children that are you know approaching adolescence. Anyway, they're not really adults yet, but certainly uh, children that are in adolescence by the time that uh, he doesn't have toddlers. That's true, 
And, and so, you know, does that produce a different, you know, it's always this interesting thing of does, does, does the change lead us back to the same road or, you know, or, or to the extent that it's different, how different is it? I would argue, as, as Alexis and I are discussed in that episode, it's a very different Elizabeth who assumes mm-hmm. the throne under different yeah. circumstances. And so what does that mean even down, you know, to today? First of all, she wouldn't be the longest reigning monarch because she would have started much later, uh, but it also may be a different type of scenario. And to your point, you know, what would some of the thoughts be about, you know, the role of the monarch as Church of England, uh, head of the Church of England, if, you know, if Edward's allowed to hold that position? <laughs> and as you apply, you make an excellent point that I guess I really hadn't even thought about. <laughs> the, the, the whole, the, one of the, not the only reason you get an well, English Reformation, but the well, main the reason Simpsons. you get an English Reformation the big yeah, reason. Is, that, yeah. is, is that, is that, you know, uh, Henry wants, Henry wants to, to do a little trade in here. Yeah. And um, and he's able to do that. And the way that he's able to do that is by arguing that he uh, has the right as sovereign to be the head of the church. And so it's ironic. I, I appreciate you pointing that sense of irony that later, uh, this is the very reason why Ed, one, of the reason, one of the very reasons why Edward VIII feels like he has to abdicate is that he can't make a similar type of choice if he wanted to. And and you looked at me like I was crazy, but I do want to give credit where credit is due. That irony wasn't my own. It was a writer on The Simpsons. They, they oh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. The Simpsons yeah. did it. At the end of the at the end of the day, <laughs> Homer can teach us a little yes. bit about Homer Simpson versus Homer the epic poet. Yeah. can teach us a little bit about everything. <laughs> Although I do have to point out, with Henry VIII, he made the argument that his first marriage never happened. Right. Yes. So in his mind, Anne Boleyn was wife number one. Yeah. And how many other no wives were there? One. How many other wives were there? You can that, make that argument true. once. Exactly. You can only <laughs> yeah. make the argument once, but there's uh, the some, argument. Some some of them lost their heads. He didn't divorce all of them. It yeah. doesn't apply for wives two through five. Okay. Or yeah. two through six. Well, I guess I read something just this past week, and there clearly was there the plan for wife number seven. I guess that now historians are very clear that that was probably in the works when he uh, when he passed away. So you'd have to have an entirely different coffee mug than you do now, Alexis, if that were to happen. Because uh, you have your famous uh, disappearing disappearing wives of Henry coffee mug based upon the heat of the liquid. Would so it Chris, just be a what, smaller font? I, I think it's just a smaller font. <laughs> Maybe, maybe so. <laughs> the silhouettes have to be a little yeah. closer together. A little bit all. closer together. Yeah, it, it's a different arrangement. So, Chris, did we miss any of the big points of uh, this, this change with the idea of, uh, again, and you started out here just to be clear to bring this thing full circle. The reason this timeline is different is that you don't have the abdication of, of Edward VIII. And Edward then exercises, as you well point out, really the one still role that exists inside the English monarchy, which is when there's a question about who's going to be asked to form the government, they were allowed to weigh in. I, I'm struck now thinking about the change in Britain between Henry VIII and that and, and Edward VIII, which is Henry has the power to take Britain out of the Catholic world to really realign geopolitically the entire nation on who he wants to be married to come down to edward and he has this one thing this is the only thing he can do the only thing he could do to affect policy in britain at all right well and in fact as well portrayed again we 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 might as well just go ahead and keep hyping it and I'll, I'll contact them to see if they'll give us a sponsorship. But, you know, one of the things that you do see in the crown there is this idea that's actually in the most recent uh, season, season four, is that the very fact that the monarch would speak out at all politically is yeah. something of an outrage. Yeah, uh, they don't do that. They just don't do that, which is, you know, t- which is, again, comparing the eights, <laughs> Henry versus Edward. Yeah, that's a pretty substantial difference. <laughs> As you go through there. All right. Lex, did you have any comments on anything? Uh, Chris and I sort of got rolling here and we, uh, we had you, you were in the sidecar for most of this. Do you want to take the wheel for a second? I just, I, to go back a little bit from what we were talking about, when we mentioned Chamberlain, for, first of all, when we were talking about 1803, immediately before you even said it, Chris, Chamberlain pops in my head yeah. when you said Chamberlain. <laughs> The, the I remember the very first thing learning about Chamberlain and the thing that always sticks in my head, appeaser. 
Chamberlain was the appeaser. So I, I, I like that parallel. Hadn't thought of that parallel before, but it is a, it's a strong parallel. Yeah. Well, and, 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 you know, the idea there, of course, the famous phrase that he's known for is, you know, peace in our time. Yeah. Uh, which apparently lasted what? How long? <laughs> Not um, very. As interestingly enough, I like to do the math on it, whether it lasted longer or shorter than the piece of Amiens. It last both of them lasted about a year. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, 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 very long. <laughs> yeah, and, and as and as you well point out, you know, this is one of the things past we didn't go down. We, we won't have the time to do it today. But you know, the assumption would be, you know, the, the question is always asked why when there was still conflict, you know, the Battle of Britain is going on. It's, I guess there was some discussion of, I, I guess, Operation Sea Line is what the code name was for the, uh, for the German invasion of the British Isles, but that sort of didn't get anywhere in terms of a practical sense. You know, we, we all ask the question of why does Hitler open up the, the Barbarossa? Why the second front? You know, why would you do that? Well, if you're actually sitting in a period of ag agreed peace and armistice, whatever you want to call what's been achieved uh, by the Halifax government is uh, even more reason that he's more likely to do it. You know, I don't have to worry about my Western front. <laughs> uh, I can, I can now pursue fully what I want to on the Eastern front. I, and I'm, I'm so maybe you can have Barbarossa kick off even earlier. I, so. I'm, I'm interested in thinking about the Russian policy during the Napoleonic Wars of Yes, we're okay with the continental system, but we're violating it. So Russia, even in our timeline, was kind of in a position to straddle the two right. sides of the Hitlerian wars. I'm going back to that because we stopped talking about the Pacific. Yeah, well, and, and, and they're all cousins anyway, thanks to Victoria. So uh, mm, yeah. I is Victoria may be a glimmer in her parents' eye at this point. We yeah, are still I, talking the 18s. Yeah, well, but 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 but, but then you have the sim you have the similar concept that carries down to how Russia, Russia, Russia is European and not at the right. you know sort of at the same time that that even carries down to today, because right. of just the size of the country is that you know, um, I think we struggle with trying to place what Russia is because part of it is European, uh, part of it is obviously not, <laughs> and and how do, and how do you you know drag those it's, two things together and make them work together it's not to step on too many toes but given that i'm in north carolina right now it's like texas barbecue it's kind of barbecue but not quite there yet um uh, see <laughs> how, how how long did how long <laughs> trivia question how long was chris a contributor on a fork in time we're going to say about 80 percent of one episode <laughs> Because he's because you've done you've done issued fighting words there. If you come if you come for Tex Mex, it's over, Chris. Um, my next target is Chicago Pizza. I have well, so many things to talk about there. Yeah, <laughs> I, we we probably can agree more on pizza than we might on barbecue. You know, the, the nature of barbecue is like is like anything. Every everybody's local version is the right version, right? Yeah. So. Uh, uh, we can offend somebody in Kansas City as quick as we can get offended here in Texas about your 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 we'll just call them heretical views about barbecue, but we'll leave it at that. <laughs> so, all right, well, good deal. Anybody have anything else before we close out? Uh, not necessarily. I think we've had you know a What's fun that? episode. Had a lot of different things come into it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you, we we just rewrote the middle of the 20th century again. That's what we do here on a fork yeah. in time. Is, is figuring that out. Well, well again, we ended Chris, up in the same place with the same person. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot of that. Alexis and I talk about even off podcast about that, you know, yeah, it's a fork in time, but that road just leads back around in some way kind of thing, uh, which actually does give me a little bit of a chance to push the uh, the concept of what I mentioned on the last episode that we did from the, uh, from the survey a few weeks back, the big theme survey. And so one of the things that we will be doing in 2021 are exploring some of those themes in a slightly different way. Because we do have this realization that so often a different jumping off point takes us to a different place, but then it somehow brings us back around again to the same set of forces. For example, we're in 1936. Yes, he did it well there. He, he, he didn't slip. But yet we end up talking about the Reformation. 
Yeah. <laughs> because right. because you can't and, you can't eventually get away from the Reformation. If you're talking about England, you can't get from the way from the Reformation for too far for too long. And just just to intentionally try and confuse you, we spent a lot of time talking about the 1800s. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, my, yeah, why you is can't get away from 1533 and around 1803 to 1840. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because again, th there's a reason why we talk about history repeating itself or that we're doomed to repeat it is that there's elements of, there's similarities that happen again. I mean, you were making the, the, the parallels there between the different, you know, sort of pieces that don't last for very long. And there's a reason for that. They were not stable situations to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so it was inevitable that something was going to, you know, break them pretty quickly uh, because they were, they were put together so hastily. And uh, it's a good deal. All right. Uh, so again, we appreciate you guys joining us here today on A Fork in Time. Again, we welcome Chris to the podcast. Hope that our listeners find that to be an exciting thing. Uh, we're going to close out here as we normally do, mentioning that if you want to learn more about the show, uh, look at past episodes, give us suggestions, give us feedback, take surveys. We had a COVID check-in this week, by the way, Alexis. I don't know if you saw that come in on the email. We still invite folks to do that because we want to know what's happening now. As we see some encouraging news with, you know, we're, if Maybe I never a, hear the word COVID vaccine again in my life, it will be too soon. Yeah, but the uh, but the fact that we're able to talk about vaccines, that's an exciting thing here. And, and yes, maybe it is. Returning to some By sense way, of normalcy. Second person vaccinated, William Shakespeare. Here we come, English Reformation again. I saw that. Yeah, it's actually, uh, <laughs> that, that was... Uh, that couldn't have been by happenstance, right? That I, had I, to be staged, I, right? I do feel like there was a security guard who was supposed to make sure that he was the first person, and this 90-year-old grandmother <laughs> got there before him and just was not giving up her spot in line. There, there was some go. PR person who was responsible for and and he had one job, and he did not get William Shakespeare the first person vaccinated. Yeah, I, uh, that, the, the, I guess that will be... God, I do hope for the day when we actually have COVID trivia and we think of it being the type of thing that's worthy of trivia. But, you know, I, I predict that 15 years from now on some game show, that question is going to come up. Who was the second person to receive um, the COVID vaccines? And of course, the other event today that we're recording on December 8th for this episode that we'll, uh, that we'll publish later in the week here. Uh, but today's also in American history, an interesting date, looking at a legend, Chuck Yeager uh, passed away today. And, uh, if, you, uh, if you're a fan of aviation, as I am, if you're a fan of things like the space race and uh, the things that went on, uh, that, that, that's a name I was sad to hear, that that 97-year-old that American icon passed away today. So um, uh, just we'll, we'll, recognize that, we'll recognize that fact while we're talking about some of the other things that are here. Of course, at the website, you can also find our links to social media. That would make my daughter happy if you did stuff like that. And of course, uh, other ways that you can support the show, including our Patreon page, if you're so inclined to do so. Uh, so getting ready to close out here. I'm going to give Alex and Chris both uh, a last chance to say something before I uh, find some way to spin us to the way that we normally close out episodes in a clever way. So Alex, do you have anything you want to say before we go? Uh, just that it was nice to be on an episode again. It's been a while, but hopefully I'm going to get back into a more stable and uh regular uh episode routine here i've had i've had some changes uh in my life recently but i think i think we're getting back to a normal routine uh coming here soon so this is fun i agree chris anything from you i just want to thank you guys for the opportunity to have people listen to me about these crazy ideas of mine uh, and, uh, I, enjoy, I, I enjoy doing it and uh, as of this afternoon looking at buzzsprout statistics there's 382 people that are estimated to want to hear this episode so uh we're, we're drawn in close on that 400 listener mark which that may not sound like a big thing to big big real podcasts <laughs> but to this little uh this little endeavor that started out on a saturday night with me plugging a microphone into a computer uh, because I had nothing else to do on a Saturday night. We, we've made some progress on it. So uh, good deal. Chris, welcome aboard again. And uh, Alexis, uh, we sort of close most shows the same way in an ode to our, our good friend, and Kenny Cole. And uh, he uh, sort of adapted the, uh, he, he has a favorite Yogi Berra-ism, and I'm a big baseball fan. And so we sort of adapt that for the podcast. And our listeners probably know what I'm about to say, but if they should happen to find a fork in time, what would be the, your recommendation to them? 
Take it. Take it. All right. Thanks, guys. Hope you join us next time. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more about the podcast at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Join us next time.